Okay, shalom everyone. Today is Wednesday, May 12th, and we are here together for our weekly lunch and learn. I hope everyone has their own lunch. And um, I, th I see Ellie has tea. I'm assuming that's tea, Ellie. Yes, Rabbi, it's tea. It's hot tea. Hot tea, excellent. Normal people drink. Okay. And uh, all right, so let's uh, let's get started. So this Shabbat is Parshat Bamidbar, and according to the Sefer Achinuch, there are no mitzvot uh, to count in Parshat Bamidbar. Although there are lots of laws in Parshat Bamidbar, but they are counted elsewhere as mitzvot, and so the primary source is not counted in Bamidbar. However, what we do have in Bamidbar uh, for sure is. A lot of discussion about the work of the Leviim in the Beit HaMikdash. And we're, that's what we're going to study. We're going to talk about the work of the Leviim in the Beit HaMikdash, what their job was, uh, and who could do it, who couldn't do it. And we'll see some interesting things related to that. This is not a topic that is uh, often studied. Um, so hopefully we'll all gain some new insight today. So here we go. Mitzvah 394. Uh, I did. I did use a text from the Sefer Achinuch that does discuss some of what the uh, some of what the Leviim do, um, and we'll get to that. Uh, that's maybe we'll start with that, um, and then we'll go back to uh, explaining uh, it in a little bit more uh, detail. I'm going to switch views here so that we have the regular side by side view. Um, so we could actually see the text side by side. Okay, this is our this is our regular view, what we what we're accustomed to. So let's look at the mitzvah first. Even though the pasuk is not from this week's parsha that's mentioned uh, in the Sefer Achinuch, we'll get back to what is specific uh, to this week's parsha in just a few minutes. Okay, so here we go. Sefer Achinuch mitzvah three ninety four, the commandment of the service of the Leviim in the temple in the Beit Hamikdash. Mitzvat avodat haLeviim baMikdash. Um, so actually, let me ask a question. Does anyone have any idea what the job of the Leviim was in the Beit HaMikdash? To help the Kohanim. Okay, good. To help the Kohanim. Excellent, Shula. Uh, Zach? They were musicians and they have to play uh, music during uh, 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 during service uh, conduct. Good. Okay. Not just musicians, but also singers. Yes. Right. Mus Correct. Musician and, si and singer. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Anyone else? That's Rabbi here. Yep. Um, they also had to clean. They had to sweep up the the burnt ashes and put them somewhere. No. No, that was part of the avodah. That's the kohanim did that. Actually. Oh, they did that. Oh, all right. Actually, that's uh, that's uh, the last few days of Daf Yomi uh, was a discussion of uh, of that. It's called the Truma Tadeshen, taking off some of the ashes. Another act. Another the two things dealing with the ashes. One is to clear all the ashes off the altar. That was done every once in a while and brought outside of the Beit Hamikdash. And then there was the Truma Tadeshen, which is taking a little bit of the ashes every day. But in any case, that was the Kohanim. All right, I got it wrong. Not specifically the Levian. Okay. Okay. Okay, anybody else? What uh, else uh, did the uh, Kohanim, the Levium do in the Beit HaMikdash? Any other suggestions, ideas? <laughs> Go ahead, Bobby Sue. I don't know, but I, don't, the, don't they go out and wash, help wash the hands or feet or something of the uh, Kohanim? Or, yeah, that's helping the Kohanim. That, yes, that's right. Like Shula said, that's an example of helping oh, the I missed Kohanim. It. Sorry, Excellent. I didn't hear that. Right. Excellent. Okay, let's see what the Sefer Achinuch says. Great. Here we go. Mitzvah avodat halivim mikdash liot halivim ovdim mikdash liot shoarim umishorim bechol yom al hakarban. So, one thing we did not say, and one thing we did say: the Levites serve in the Beit Hamikdash to be the gatekeepers and to sing every day over the sacrifice. Shneemar the avad halavihu, and the Levite shall serve, etc. The lashon sifri. So first of all, that's what we learned. We learned that their jobs, and we're going to see other things too. But their job was to 
be the Same. gatekeepers, right? They would open up the Beit HaMikdash in the morning and lock up the Beit HaMikdash at night. And they were also, as Zach said, they sang during specific parts of the Avodah, during specific parts of the, of the service. And then the, the Sefer HaChiduch says, let's just understand what's at stake here. The Lashon Sifri, Shomea Ani Im Rotse Ya'avod Im Lo Rotse Lo Ya'avod. Maybe it means that if the Levi wants to do the work he's, to serve in the Beit HaMikdash, he can. But if he does not want to serve in the Beit HaMikdash, he does not have to. Tamud Lomar, Ba'avad Halivi Hu Al Karcho. He's forced to. He must work in the Beit HaMikdash. Every Levi has to do their tour of duty, if you will, in the Beit HaMikdash, and they don't have a choice. This is an obligation. And it is incumbent upon him. Absolutely. Not only is the Levi obligated, but anyone else who does the singing is in violation of a rule of the Torah. And here he quotes the Gemara in Erechin that no one should ever say the song of the, of the Leviim in the temple besides the Leviim. It It's already mentioned elsewhere that they serve in God's name. What service is considered to be done in the name of God, Have Omer Shira. This is the singing in the Beit HaMikdash. Okay, so there you have it. They sing and they close and open the Beit HaMikdash and they are obligated to do it. It is not a choice. Last week, was it last week or the week before, we also talked about something related uh, and we thought that maybe if they wanted to, it would be uh, it's, it, it, they'd be a lot, they would be permitted to, but if they didn't want to, it would not be obligatory. Um, I'm trying to remember, I'm going to go back and check what that was real quick. Um, yes, that was about the, about the land return, right? They, during the, the land return had to be done, even if uh, the two parties agreed that they didn't want it to be done. Uh, it had to be done, as opposed to, um, as opposed to the ability to forget to to continue collecting the loans after shemitah. The return of the land was not was not optional. Okay. Let's continue in the sefer achinuch for for a little while. So this is what they're obligated to do. Mishar sheha mitzvah. So now the question is why, right? What's the what's the purpose of this mitzvah? What's the reason for this uh, for this mitzvah? Anyone like to? Suggest what the reason for this mitzvah is. No takers. Go ahead, Zach. Yes. Uh, we do have uh, in Torah uh, a few cases when uh, Jewish people gather uh, uh, to sing. Um, and uh, 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 Miriam one of the case. Then uh, in, uh, uh, mm, uh, in Tanakh, we have uh, uh, Devorah. Um, examples of uh, uh, singing as uh, I call this uh, uh, Tfilah prototype, that what was before uh, it started. I think that uh, um, uh, away from Avoda, which is uh, um, uh, Kohanim, had to perform, it was a, a part of their obligation. Uh, right. So it, it, it enhances the avoda. Y yes. Right. right. I also yeah. wonder if it sort of keeps the kohanim sort of going <laughs> as well. Right. They got a lot of work to do. Marching. <laughs> right. It keeps them going. Okay. Good. Let's see. Let's see the Sefer Achinuch. He has something to say on this as well. Mishar Shei HaMitzvah. It's proper that a king have a specific group of people, a, a specific tribe set aside to serve him. 
This is like a special guard. This is like a Lehavdil in Star Wars. You had the Jedi's, right? Only certain people get to join this club, and you, not, not everyone is allowed to join uh, this club. And uh, a non a non a non a person who's not from the tribe of Levi, because I think this also would refer to the Kohanim as well, right? Anyone from this tribe serves God. The Kohanim do do it one way, and the Levim do it another way, but they're all from the same tribe. Similar to an earthly king. Similar to uh, a earthly king, where uh, specific respected people would be appointed to do all of the work of the king uh, that was uh, that needed to be done, and it was done by their hands. It's not fitting for the king that his servants who take care of him would change every day. And this day it comes from this group, and this day it comes from another group. It's it's more honorable for the king that the king that's clear to everyone that this one group of people is always and forever dedicated to the service of the king. There's never any question who has to take care of uh, of these things, and that is what the Sefer Chinuch calls a davar barur. This is obvious. This is clear that this is the best way. This is the best way to serve God. So. So now we understand, according to the Sefer Achinuch, what the jobs were. Opening and closing the Beit HaMikdash and singing during the Avodah. And now we understand why. Why was it? Why was one specific Shevet set aside for these things? Because that's a proper way to honor a king, to have a set aside force of people who are completely dedicated to the service of God. It's a pretty easy job. You think it's an easy job? Yes. Okay. We'll see what that, we'll see what else they had to do. There may be some other things they had to do. Okay. Um, maybe it was easy. Um, but um, you know the joke about the guy who comes to the rabbi and says, "I'd like you to make me a kohen." And the rabbi says, "I I can't make you a kohen. It doesn't work that way." And he keeps offering more and more and more money. Finally, he's offering like two, three million dollars. I'll do anything. Just make me a Kohen. So I can't do it. But can you tell me why you want to be a Kohen so much? He says, yeah, my father's a Kohen. My grandfather was a Kohen. I wanted to be a Kohen just like them. Should have taken the money. OK, um, Ellie, go ahead. You have a question? Yes, I was wondering why if they were the ones that were supposed to sing, they didn't all get nice voices. Like my late husband was a, a Levite and he had an awful voice. <laughs> so it's not nice to talk about the deceased that way, by the way. Uh, he had a beautiful voice with, with which was tuneless. A beautiful neshama that did not have a voice to match. How's that? <laughs> okay, whatever. But um, um, well, uh, that's I didn't like his voice. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. That's a really good question. Be, you know, because it, maybe they didn't do they, they, Maybe if they had a bad voice, they did something else instead because there were other things to do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Uh, Zach. Rabbi, we know that uh, um, in uh, Babel, when uh, Jews returned uh, back to Eretz Royal and rebuilt eventually second Beit Hamikdash, many Levim, according to the uh, uh, book of Ketuvim, decided to stay in Babel. Didn't they, didn't they violate, in this case, direct... Uh, uh, mm, yeah, uh, that's a good point. Yeah, the it, for from, a while, yeah. right, until there was a Beit HaMikdash, right. they could stay in Babel. Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure, though. That, that may be one way to look at it. Another way to look at it would be that mm -hmm. anyone who, you know, who lives in the vicinity, who lives in Israel, such a person is obligated. Ah, okay. That's a, but the, you, your point is a good one. Yeah, it could very well be uh, that it's a function of the levy and not a function of where the levy is. Right. Yeah, it could be. That's an excellent question. Um, okay. 
Um, here we go. Let us continue. Me the ikar vodatam. What I'm sorry, midini amisa. What do they have to do? Ma shamru zechon levracha she ben levi she kibel lab kol mitzot leviyachut mi devar echad ein mikablin oto ad she kabel et kulam. So this goes a little bit to what Eli said, that a levi who accepts upon himself all of the obligations of a levi, except for one thing, we don't allow him to do anything. He's not allowed in. It's a whole, it's a package deal. So now the, the Sefer Chinah is expanding a little bit. Maybe it's not such an easy job, Shula, because the Kohanim were actually the, the guards of the Beit HaMikdash, and they had shifts, and they had to be constantly walking around the parameter, the perimeter of the Beit HaMikdash just to make sure that everything was in order. They were shomrim at hamikdash. Kol shakatavnu b'seder zeh vayumahem shoarim liftoach with a score shorim mikdash. And among those who also, one of the jobs of some of the people who guarded the Beit Hamikdash was also to open it and close it. But that wasn't their only job. They also had to guard it, and that was um, an all night, every day, all day obligation. Now, they, of course, they switched off, but it's now we're adding to their workload a little bit. The ikar volatam, but the core of their service, the shorer ala karban velohayum mishira ela baolot sibor shehein chova. The core of their service was to sing when the bait, when the sacrifices were being brought. But now the sefer chinuch reminds us that they only sang when certain of the of the uh, karbanot were brought, and they would only say song with the communal burnt offerings that are obligatory. And upon the peace offerings of Shavuot, and at the time of the wine pouring, but not every voluntary offering that the community would make for the end of the altar. Meaning, not every time that someone brought a karban did a levy have to be drafted in order to sing. It was only for certain karbanot that they had to uh, be drafted. Okay. Um, other carbonote they didn't have to sing for. Leviha onain mutar la avod shorer. A levi who's an onain, meaning between death and burial of a loved one that they would have to sit shiva for, is allowed to do the singing of the songs. Right? It says here an onain is permitted to serve and sing. And as Zach said, they used to sing, and they were not allowed to have less than 12 Leviim standing there in order to, uh, to sing. And you can have as many as you want, just keep adding and adding. That's probably Berov Am Hadrat Melech, right? The more people who are engaged in a mitzvah or in, or in any religious activity, Right, the rov am hadrat melech. It's the more to the glory of the king when more people are doing something at the same time. Right, so it makes a larger impression rather than people doing it in smaller groups or one at a time. Okay. Um, and they sang with their mouths. Uh, so mostly they were singing with their with their mouth, but others would be there and play instruments, as we said. Some of the Levim and some of them pedigreed Israelites um, were also able to go up to the platform. That they would be permitted to marry Kohanim. Uh, so some of those were allowed to go up uh, onto the onto the Duchan where the Levim were uh, were singing. And now it talks about some of the musical instruments that were lure, that were used. How many? What were they? We don't have to uh, get into uh, into that. Okay. Let's now swing back to the uh, top. Actually, let's, let's see the Rambam here. Zera Levi Kulo Muvda Lavoda Tamikdash and Emar Baeta Hi Hivdil Hashem Echevet Levi. The entire 
progeny, right? Anyone who came from Levi are set apart to work in the Beit HaMikdash, whether as a Kohen or a Levi. And we have a puzzle here at the time that God set apart the tribe of, of Levi. Like we saw in the Kulan. Yes, they accept all of the laws of the Levim. Okay. Um, and now we talk about guard duty and other things they have to do. Okay, now let's get to the top. So basically, we've, we've, we've so far arrived at three jobs. One is guard duty. Two is uh, singing. And three is playing musical instruments. Right? We, could, we could sort of put uh, those two together. It's providing the, the, um, the, the music with a combination of singing and musical instruments to the Levim when they do the Avodah in the Beit HaMikdash. Now, let's see some other suggestions. First of all, here are some other psukim in Bamidbar that talk about this. This is from Parsh. This is the first, this one here on top is from Parshat Bamidbar. So there is a direct connection to our, pas, to our uh, Parsha. V'zot asu lahem v'chayu v'lo yamutu. Do this with them that they may live and not die. Bigishtam et Kodesh Akadashim Aronu Vanav Yavo Visamu Otam Ish Ish Al Avodato Vyamaso. Let Aaron and his sons go in and assign each of them his duties for their protege. So everyone gets their duties. This is the this is the parsha where we first start to learn of the Avodah of the Levim. And later on in the parsha, it says, Vyata Hafke the Levim al Mishkan Aidut, you should appoint the Levim over the Mishkan. Yalkol Kelav, and over all of its um, its its kalim, all of its utensils, the Yalkol Asher Lo, and everything re- related to it, Yisu Et Hamishkan Vietkol Kelav Vehem Yeshartuhu Saviv LeMishkan Yachanu. When the tabernacle is to move, it was their job also to take it down and pack it up and to carry it. That's another job of the Levim Shula. They have to carry the Beit the, the Mishkan through the desert. Right, and they did not have, um, you know, cars. They had wagons, right? They had to carry it through the through the Mishkan, through the desert. And when they and the, and not only that, but when they when they were ready to leave, they had to break it down. And then when they encamped, they had to put it back together. Okay. The Shamar Levim at Mishkan do it, and they also were responsible to protect the sanctuary. Let's see what that means. Rashi, on this question of the, the Shartu, this question of um, Rashi elsewhere says, and bring the Shabbat Levi before Aaron that they minister to him. And, then, and Rashi asks, ask the question. Mahu um, Ulisharet. Right, what does this mean to serve God? What do I have to do? The Shamrut Mishmarto, Rashi says, they shall keep his charge. Because the care, really, the guarding of the Beit HaMikdash is on them. Talking about uh, another family, another group of people accepting punishment, that thou, sons of thy father, shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary if anything happens. They have to go, they're responsible. Avon HaMikdash, Valeviyim Halalu Misayinoto Zohi Asherut. Rashi explains to have reference to the iniquity committed to a stranger in approaching the holy things. And these levies aided them and therefore was their ministering alluded to. So here they're helping the Kohanim as well. So we have them helping the Kohanim. We have them singing. We have them building the Mishkan, taking down the Mishkan. Um, the Malvim adds that, they, that this was a, an opportunity for them to be, become very close to God because the sheer singing was chelek min havodah. Singing was a part of the service and therefore they're participating in the service, which we normally thought was reserved for the kohanim. 
now we're hearing that even though the Kohanim have to do the classic things that we call the Avodah, here the Malbim says singing is part of that. It's like a sub part of it, it sounds like. Even though there's a not Kohanim, if it was a full-fledged part of the av Avodah, maybe only a Kohen could do it. But here we're seeing that it was part, partly an Avodah, and since it was partly Avodah and the Levim did it, they get very, very close to God because of this. And now we, we see something else that they had other activities. This is what Shula said earlier. The Shartuoto, Lishmor, right? The beginning here, guarding it means to, or serving it means to guard, Kamoshim Mufurash, about Avodah, Lo Avod. But they were not allowed to do the actual Avodah. Aval nos ima mishkan v'kelav, but they did carry the mishkan and its utensils, as we see in the pasuk which we just read. Ubeshat atzorich shokatin akarban kishchita afilu bizar kshira, and when necessary, they would also get to shech the carbon. Oh. Now we know the carbon could be shechted by a czar, by a non kohen. I'm not sure if you realize that the the the, the, the shechting of the of, of a carbon could be done by a non kohen. So here, sometimes they would draft the Leviim because they didn't have, uh, they needed more people and maybe there was no one else around or the Yisraelim didn't know how to do it if it was their Karban. And so they would do it. So here you see, they're really helping the, the, uh, the Kohanim. Even a non-Kohen is allowed to do the Shechita. And he quotes a Pasuk uh, from, uh, from that. Uh, and so now we have another added thing that the, the Leviim did. So the list keeps getting bigger and bigger, Shula. Uh, of things that they had to do. Okay, Rav Hirsch basically says that they had to do assorted jobs like we've seen, uh, like we've seen before. And here in Devarim, we have a very interesting take. The Devarim says, And of Levi, he said, your Tumim and your Urim, which is what they wore, are with your godly one, whom you provide, proved at Masa, with whom you strove with orzim riva. Haomer la avivli mo lo riitiv et achiv lo ikir et banav lo yada ki shamru imratcha uvetoratcha in soru, for they have observed your word and kept your covenant. So here they're keeping the Torah, and then in pasuk yud pasuk tet yoru mishpatecha le Yaakov, they shall teach Yaakov your ordinances, the toratcha le Israel, and your Torah to Israel. They shall put the incense before you and the, the chalil al mizbechecha and your flute on the altar, in this case, the burnt offering. Right? Oh, that's a big job to teach. Hold on one second. I just heard a fire truck. I wanted to make sure everything was okay. Okay. Um, so now on this, the, the, um, the Sephorno on the Pasuk says, the Pasuk that talks about them uh, teaching, Moses daven to Hashem, that since this, they, they, they've stood up the test of time, they've always been loyal, give them, God says, the, the wisdom to teach. That if the teacher is comparable to an angel, meaning that the teacher's behavior is upright and proper, then people should learn from that teacher. And if the teacher's uh, behavior is not upright, then they should not learn from that teacher. And Moshe is saying, look, the Bnei Israel, the, the Levim, their, their uh, behavior has been upright. So they're the ones who you should have, uh, who you should have, uh, who you should have teach. And so now that's another job. So we, we keep adding more and more jobs to the Levim. It sounds like anything the Kohanim are not going to do, the Levim are going to have to do, right? It's like uh, they're the catch-all for the things that needed to be done for, uh, for Am Yisrael. Okay, let's, um, let's look at just a few more sources. The Mishnah Torah, the Rambam, Zera Levi Kulo Muvdal Avodat Hamikdash. Oh, we saw this already, right? That uh, the entire progeny of Levi are set aside for the Beit Hamikdash and what they have to do. 
Okay? And now the Ralbag in explaining why again. The tribe of Levi was set aside to serve in Beit HaMikdash to bring more honor to the Mishkan. The choicest Shevet is the one that was chosen to do this service. We already talked about this, he said. By them being there, it adds honor to the Beit HaMikdash. Every big house has a, has a guard. Now we have an alarm, I guess. But back in the day, we didn't have alarms. So everyone, every, every fancy house, every rich person, everything important needed a guard. So of course you need to have a guard on the Beit HaMikdash, even if there really was very low risk of anything happened. As a symbol of its importance, it needed to be there. And to show that they were special, they weren't even counted, right? They didn't get land. We would think that's something bad, but it's actually good. They're separate. They're completely unique. And anyone who came to those areas where only the Kohanim and Levim were allowed to serve, that was a death penalty offense. So the Levim here are, are treated and pointed out to be very special in terms of their avodah. Okay. Um, Rabbi. Yes. <clears throat> so when, what are they supposed to teach? Is it, does it have anything to do with the, with the Bet HaMikdash? Um, Everything. They were the teachers. It sounds like they were the teachers of Torah to all of B'nai Yisrael. Besides caring for the Bet HaMikdash. But this yeah. is not particularly holy, the teaching. It's not required being from, um, from certain Shevet. I mean, they don't have to be Levim. Well, that's a good question. It's, 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 that's an excellent point. Meaning, I, I, I'm not sure if only Levi'im could teach, but Levi'im were certainly given the privilege and the opportunity um, to uh, to teach. So it has not relating to their duty with Avodat Oh, oh, yeah, not necessarily. Not necessarily. That's what I meant. Yeah, not necessarily. Correct. One other one other point we'll make here, which is, um, there's a debate who carried the Mishkan. I mentioned before in one of the sources that the Leviim did, but here we have, we have other sources. The Gemara Masechet Sota says, Tanu Rabbanan, Ketzad Avru Yisrael et Hayardain. How did the Jewish people cross the Jordan? Bechol yom aro nosea achar, shnei digalim, vayom nasat chila. Generally, when they were walking through the desert, the ark would travel behind uh, Yehuda and Ruvain. But on this day, when they crossed the Yardin into Eretz Israel, the ark traveled in front of them. A pasuk that says it goes before you. Every day the Levim carried the Aron. And today the Kohanim carried. So you see that the Levim, according to this source, carried it every day, and the, the Levim carried it every day, but the Levim carried it, I'm sorry, the Levim carried it every day, but the Kohanim carried it across the uh, Aron, across the, the, the Jordan. Tanya Rabbi Yossi Omer, B'Shlosha Mikomot Nasu Kohanim et Aron, Kishavru et Hayardain, Kishahesivu et Yericho, Ukishahziruhu Limkomot. Three different times the Levim actually carried it, and not the, the Kohanim carried it, and not the Levim. The Rambam has a little bit of a different take. Um, and the Rambam says as follows. We'll read it quickly in English. The 34th mitzvah that we are commanded that the Kohanim shall carry the ark on their shoulder whenever it is moved from one place to another. So there, according to the Rambam, the Kohanim did this, not the Levim. The source of this mitzvah is God's statement. He did not give any wagons to the descendants of Kahat 
since they had responsibility for the most sacred articles, they had to carry on their shoulders. And even though the commandment was said at that time to the Levi'im, this was only because Aaron was the first Kohen, and therefore a number of Kohanim at that time were very small. For future generations, however, the mitzvah is incumbent upon the Kohanim. So the Rambam answers his own uh, contradiction. At the beginning, it was the Levi'im, because there weren't enough Kohanim. But later, when the population of Kohanim grew, then they were the ones who carried it. So maybe in the early generations, the Levi'im carried it, and later, the, uh, the, the Kohanim carried it. So you have this question is exactly who did it. Uh, according to the Gemara, it, seemed, it sounds like the Levi'im did it always, except for three times. And according to the Rambam, he's understanding the Gemara that that's only talking about early on in the history, but later it was left to the uh, it was left to the um, the Kohanim. So there you have it. This is uh, mitzvah number three hundred and ninety four of six hundred and thirteen. The special jobs of the Levi'im and what they had to do: singing, playing musical instruments, helping the Kohanim, shechting guarding, teaching, schlepping, they had a lot, a lot to do. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, and we see that the, the Torah has um, a particular concern about um, a uh, specific duties, who does what, so everyone knows what they have to do, and mostly to honor the building, uh, the, to honor the building, that there would always be guards and watchmen, uh, even if there was very little risk of anything happening, um, it had to be there as a symbolic way of showing that this is a very important place. And if other places of importance, like a castle, like a king's castle are going to have, uh, right, are going to have uh, guards, then certainly the Beit HaMikdash also has to have it in order to indicate just how important it is. Uh, Rabbi? Yes. Uh, you said that the Levi'im are carrying the Aaron, but then you said that the Kohanim also carry it. That during the day, and the Kohanim also, you said that they also have some part in carrying their own. Who is carrying their own? The Levi'im or Kohanim or both of them? So it's, um, it's, it's the, according to the Rambam, it sounds like early on it was the Levi'im and later on in history was the Kohanim. What do you mean by later on? After there were more, after the, after there were more Kohanim. At first there were very few Kohanim because they were only coming from our own and oh. everyone else from Shevet Levi was a Levi. So until Kohanim, more Kohanim were born and there were more people to do the job, the Leviim did it. But once there were enough Kohanim, the Kohanim did it. That's what the Rambam says. When the Kohanim carried it, the Leviim are not, not supposed to do that. Maybe they cheered them on. You All can right. do it, Kohanim. We have, we, have, we have faith in you. Still, um, so right. would, that, would that mean then that the that the Levi'im had to give up their responsibilities at some point? Only on, only, according to the Rambam, only the responsibility of carrying the Mishkan. Oh, just carrying. But okay. not everything else. Right. Good question. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining. Great to see you. See you soon, I hope. Have a wonderful day and a, enjoy the rest of the week. Hope that things in Israel will calm down and everyone will be safe. And... Um, and also good Shabbos to everyone. And Chag Sameach. Shavuot's on Sunday night. Okay. Bye -bye. You will have your class Thursday? Uh, the, the class will be yeah, Thursday night. I'll have my class. Yeah. Okay. Rabbi, I have yeah. a question. <clears throat> yes, Mary. Were Levi's required to marry someone from the tribe of Levi, or could they marry anybody? They can marry anybody. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.